Hello, this is your board, Dr. Sean Boy. Super excited to have you back with me today for the podcast, How to Play the Game of College. I'm very excited about tonight. The past few weeks, you've heard from professionals on the student services side. You learned about recruitment. You learned about admissions, just student success in general. But tonight, we're taking you inside the classroom. Yes, we have a faculty member here today, and I'm so excited to have him here. Dr. Corey Reed. How are you doing tonight, Dr. Corey Reed? I'm doing well. How are you? Yes, I'm good. I'm so good and super glad to have you here tonight. And again, I think your this conversation is going to be really enlightening to our students and their parents to really hear what faculty members look for when we talk about student success inside the classroom and really looking at strategies to help those students to succeed once they get there. And the ultimate goal, right, Dr. Reed, is for those students to graduate. And so what I want to do, again, while I welcome you to the podcast, and if you could just start off by telling us your name, your title, um, and just a little bit of, of your background, like how did you get to become Dr. Reed today? Absolutely. Well, my name is Corey Reed. I am an assistant professor of philosophy at Butler University, specifically in the philosophy department. I'm also affiliated in the race, gender, and sexuality studies program here at Butler. I wear quite a few service hats, but that's that's beside the point. My kind of road to where I am now, I am a proud Milwaukee native. I went through the International Baccalaureate program in high school, which introduced me to a class called Theory of Knowledge. And that's when I fell in love with philosophy. So I have a, a rare story of doing this to a certain extent from high school forward. I'm a proud graduate of the best college for black males across the country, Morehouse College. Yes, sir. Uh, and I wear that proudly. I did a little time teaching secondary ed in Philadelphia before I came back to graduate school. I got my master's at the University of Louisville in comparative humanities and then my PhD from the University of Memphis specifically in philosophy. And now I am at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is an amazing campus. And we can talk a bit more about that. But I tell everybody, Dr. Reed is because of Morehouse. And that will be a good touching point that I'll probably talk a lot about today. Yes. And I was going to say, Dr. Reed, again, super excited to have you tonight. And one thing we talk about, I talk about in the book is selecting the right college, right? Which is kind of the foundation, I feel like. And most students, if you get the right college, the right fit, you're good to go. And so with many of our guests, you know, they talk about maybe their undergraduate experience. How did you select Morehouse College? Can you talk yeah, about I was interested. I, the first thing that I kind of took with me was I was very much wanting to go to an HBCU when I graduated from high school. And part of the reason for that was I had an experience where a lot of the times that my intelligence was referenced by teachers or otherwise, it kind of always came with a sort of caveat. Like I was smart for someone who looked like me, not just smart in the general sense. And I had been in the IV program. I went to a Catholic school before that. So I was very much used to being the outlier. I graduated with seven other black males in the program I was in. So it was a very, very small community. And so I said, I want to go to an HBCU. So even though I got into schools like NYU, University of Chicago, Marquette, I was mainly applying for HBCUs like Howard, Morehouse, FAMU, TCU, et cetera. And when I came across Morehouse, it was instant fall in love. I felt the support as a Black man. I felt a sense of community and history that I hadn't felt anywhere else. And so after the admitted students tour, I was sold. The only thing we had to navigate was how much it costs, right? <laughs> but I was sold on Morehouse early. I think that piece that you mentioned about finding the right college is essential. And I tell students all the time, research, 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 go visit, get the vibe, talk to people who are already there that tells you that you're going to be able to survive and thrive in that space. Right. And Morehouse was was great in that respect. That's so good to hear. And again, you know, in the book, we mentioned there are so many different types of colleges from our HBCUs to our four-year public institutions. You have community colleges and the list just goes on and on. But like you just said, Dr. Reed, you know, take those college tours, talk to students, talk to folks who attended the college 
and really ask the questions that you want to know and really make the decision that's best for you. So again, thank you for sharing that journey to Morehouse right. College. Next, we want to talk about just different student strategies, success strategies inside the classroom, right? So it's mm -hmm. one thing, right? It's a lot of times it's, it's a lot to get students, number one, to the, the doorstep of a college. And then, of course, the many things that happen outside the classroom, we kind of addressed a lot of those in some of the previous podcasts. But when they get inside the classroom, right, which is probably one of the most important components to being in college, right? What types of success strategies, or if you're looking at students who are like thriving and you like, wow, they're killing it. Freshman year, maybe two or three, if you can just can share with students and parents that you have seen over the years. Yeah, one of the things that I notice is the beginning markers of a successful student is vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that can be intimidating. I know being a, you know, being amidst professors can sometimes be daunting, mm -hmm. but being honest about what you understand and what you don't understand okay. is one of the key ingredients that I've seen students be successful at. And I've taught from Southwest Tennessee Community College yeah. to yeah. Health College to University of Memphis to Butler. I've kind of been in all the different sort of bubbles and I've had a range of student preparation, some students who were very much ready for college, some students who probably needed a little help in their first few years. And the key ingredient that I've seen in a successful undergraduate student is vulnerability and communication, right? Okay. Dr. Reed, I understand this. I have no clue what you're talking about with that. I read over the syllabus. I understand this piece, but I'm not exactly understanding what you mean by this. I read what you told me to read. I can comprehend this. I don't comprehend that. Okay. That sort of vulnerability and communication not only piques the interest and the, and the attention of the professor, but it also helps you be successful because okay. the honest truth is all of us come with different expectations. So I would love to sit here and say, yeah, man, all faculty are on the same page about what we're looking for. It's not true. Right. So the true kind of way for a student to be successful is learning how to engage their individual courses and their individual professors mm -hmm. and understand their expectations and then rise to whatever that is. And be, you know, open if that's difficult, right? Right. My classes can sometimes be reading intensive, right? Mm, and okay. a lot of people are to read. Did you just see it? And yeah. I can yeah. help students who are open early. Okay. I can't help students who wait till two, three days before the final to say that they didn't understand things from week two or three, right? And there's a new trend now that I'm noticing the students still come to office hours for whatever reason. Okay. And that's one of the moments where you can get the most attention from your professors. We're mandated to have them. You might as well use them. That's your diet. That's your time. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you in the last few years, unless I make an assignment that makes students come in. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go a whole semester with maybe two or three office hour. And to me, that's, a waste because I yeah. learned so yeah. much from just kicking it with my professors during their office hours or whenever mm -hmm. they were in their office. Mm -hmm. I probably didn't know them a little bit, but <laughs> that was key to where I am now. Yeah. That all of my professors felt completely comfortable writing me letters of recommendation. Why? Mm -hmm. They knew me. So right? true. Yes. Yes. So open, vulnerable communication. And I'll also just say a deep sense of perseverance. I'll talk about this a little bit later, I think, but just understanding your why and letting mm -hmm. that fuel you when you don't feel like doing the stuff that college requires. That moment will come and that perseverance that you can pull from is what determines how well and how fast students get in and out, in my opinion. Right? So too. We can so talk about or not. I was going to say, Dr. Reed, I, I don't know if you read the book yet, but it seems like you have. I actually <laughs> started off with my why, like why yeah. I'm in education and why I wrote this book, right? And I couldn't agree with you mm -hmm. more, you know, starting off with their why, the end in mind, right? So the days, like you say, we all have them. You're like, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like you're out of the bed. you got all this freedom. That why, mm -hmm. right, is going to keep getting you up, right, every day. And so you can get to that end goal. Man, you're saying a lot in just one question. And so I want to think a little deeper, right? Because keep in mind, this podcast is for all types of students. And that's the reason I wrote this book. So you have some students who are first-generation college students, right? 
You have some students that parents, both parents went to school, so they might be a little bit better prepared just because, hey, I'm not a first college generation college student. When we talk yeah. about asking for help, right? And again, I feel like, again, Dr. Reed, you can just shake your head. You ain't got to say yes or no that you have read the book. And in the book, <laughs> I talk about asking for help in choosing your professor, yeah. right? What's the best way to ask for help? I think sometimes students overcomplicate just asking for help. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give that student, like you said, who might be intimidated? You know, it could be a, st a student, like you said, hey, I'm the only black student in the class. It's 300 students. I don't know what to ask or what advice would you give that student? Yeah. The first thing is you kind of have to read your professor, read the room, read how the class is set up, right? Okay. So if you take a class at Butler, that's radically different than if you take a class at, say, 300 person seminar. Right. right. So in that setting, your real true professor is the TA in a, in a lot of like very kind of explicit ways. Whereas in my classes, we cap at 25. I don't have any, anything like that. So the relationship would be more important than say in those really big classes. One of the things that I'll say is I tell students to not just read the syllabus, but understand how the professor wants to be communicated with. And what are the ways in which you can utilize that? Because you might have a professor like myself who's junior faculty, who is busy, but finds time for students in a very real sense. And okay. then you've got of your globe trotters, right? Like your more senior professors who are, you know, on the road with their research all the time. They have a focus on the students, but that can, you know, wave a little bit depending on what's going on in their research lives. And when you have that wide spectrum, you have to be able to read how I can slip in and get the attention of the professor. So okay. number one, set appointments, right? The walk-in time is good, but some professors are more receptive to that than others or whatever. I mean, they're mandated to use that time, so always do the walk-in time. But okay. set appointments, that means that you're on their calendar. They know you're coming. They set aside the time. They're not writing during that period. They're not because mm -hmm. they know you're coming. Right. Okay. And okay. Just have that time where you're like, okay, this is again what I comprehend. This is what I get. This is what I don't. And sometimes uh, the reason I say start with your syllabus or start with the instructions the instructor gave is mm -hmm. because it can be frustrating when you have students who come in and ask questions you've already answered. Right. <laughs> yeah. So true. Well, yeah. Be thorough and try to understand it first. But if you don't, that's fine. Right. Mm -hmm. Come in and ask. And the more proactive you can be, the better reception you're going to get. Right. So right. even the most big of us, if you say, look, I don't get this. Is there any time we can meet within the next two weeks? Right. Okay. okay. I will never deny that because the student has respected my time enough okay. where I can get quality feedback in the time that they need. But okay. 36, 24, 12 hours before the paper is due, not so much. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Just yeah, be proactive. That's the best thing I can say. I understand there's some introverts. There's anxiety around talking to people who are in decision making positions. And to those folks, I just want to reiterate that there are ways in which you can engage in that that has less intimidation. Also, there is a sense of like you are co-owners of this educational experience. So true, yes. So so take on that inventory and that responsibility that you are a co-investor in this space, right? right. You, you earn it up too. So that means it's a reciprocal relationship mm -hmm. and you can pull from that, right? Not the just I pay you type deal. Not like right. that, but like right. this learning space is ours. You can have a bit of agency in that communication with your professor where right. this is my experience and I want the most from my experience. Most of us would be like, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Uh, exactly. But the people who demand, especially <laughs> with their time for the professor to be able to fruitfully respond, uh -huh. that's when I think professors shut down. Okay. And we're people, you know, so, oh, oh, right. I was demanding something 24 hours before something's due. I feel like my time wasn't respected. And I also feel like the student procrastinated, so I don't owe them that. And mm -hmm. that's stuff very explicit in my syllabi. So just be respectful and proactive. That's the best thing. So true. And again, you're unpacking so much in these particular questions. But what I'm hearing, like you said, just, hey, ask for help, right? Most professors, they're in it with you. It's not many professors that 
just wake up and say, hey, I want to see Shaw fail today, right? <laughs> they wake up wanting their students to succeed. That's why they're in that work. But like you said, I'm hearing a lot of being proactive, time management, right? Um, and the key thing that I'm hearing is office hours. And I tell students mm -hmm. that all the time. And like you said, sometimes, you know, it's not even really going with like, hey, I've got a certain question or I need you to do something, but I want to get to know you better. I want to talk about mm -hmm. how you got to Professor Reed, right? And some of those things I feel like are so crucial in the education journey. So again, you know, thank you for sharing all that you're sharing. And again, I'm hitting you with questions inside the classroom. So the next one I do want to ask, a lot of times we hear students say, you know, I don't like this particular professor, right? Or, hey, I want to change classes. Is that a thing? Can you actually choose or select your professors? And if so, what's the best way to go about researching who you're about to take for that particular semester? Yeah. Um. Okay, so this one's going to be complicated because okay. there's there's all, there's avenues that students are using. Okay. But I want to be clear that some of that stuff is packed with bias, right? Okay. okay. So I don't support um, students saying, oh, I see a foreign name, or they're basing their opinions on certain students, because students tend to, not all the time, but right. they tend to only do evaluations of professors publicly that you say how bad they were or how easy they were. Okay. That, okay. That's what's happening. Yeah. So for a yeah. really fruitful experience, that might not be easy or, you know, have certain barriers to it. Those are the professors that sometimes get lost in the wind when it comes to student evaluations. Right. Students are moving away from things like it rate my professor and all that kind of stuff. But, and all of that stuff is relatively biased. And it, right. it especially hurts those of us who are of marginalized identities. Uh -huh. But here's what I tell students to often do. Our syllabi may not be done super far in advance, but we have an idea about what we're going to engage. Come talk to me about what they're teaching in the next semester. If you're interested okay. in that course, just swing by, say, hey, I saw you're teaching existentialism. How are you planning on doing that course? What are some of the things you have an idea about regarding evaluation? How much time do you kind of expect students to put in outside okay. of class to be successful in your class? Right. None of us really deny those questions, especially if we have, you know, we want students to come and take our courses if our courses are not overfilled off grip, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those are good questions to ask, and you'll be able to feel out a professor for your own opinion. Okay. Man. Okay. But I like that. which you'll tell yeah. you find that students are biased against women in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. They tend to think those instructors are more mean. They tend to take that they tend to make evaluations based off of how they speak or how they dress, et cetera. They tend to be harsher on evaluations with racial identities that are other than white, right? Any of those resemble something that would be outside of the United States context and their heritage. Okay. Um, this is all backed by data, by the way. Like, there's, these are the things you can Google. And okay. so those are things I don't want to promote because those are bad. I'm at a dominantly white institution, and there are some students who make prejudgments about my course just strictly based on what I look I think you can lose in that sense. But in the same token, number one, ask people who had no beef from mm. experience, how they enjoyed the course, talk to majors in that program, talk to, even if it's not the professor directly, like if you know somebody in that department that you kind of trust and already know, ask mm -hmm. them about colleagues' courses, right? <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. You don't really add about it, but they will mm -hmm. give you kind of authentic review of, okay, these are the things you should look for. My colleague is very writing intensive or my colleague is very reading intensive or whatever. Those are the best things I say. Now, there are technological apps. I forget some of the names of them, even if it's nothing but Twitter. I mean, a lot of students post about their experiences as professors. Right. Uh, that's totally so reliable because, again, okay. people okay. who are the most vocal are the ones yeah. who are either very upset or... They're like, yo, this was easy, easy A, da 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 da. Right, right. I don't easy A thing either. You might not have gained anything in that instance, in my So opinion. true. Yeah, so true. So again, Dr. Reed, I've, I've learned something to, tonight. I love how you're saying, like, hey, 
go off of your own personal experience. Don't <laughs> always rely on Instagram and we got Facebook. <laughs> and I love how you said even like go out to the professor before you take them, right? <laughs> or if the office hours of a current professor, like, hey, have you heard anything about you no know, Dr. Reed? You know, any <laughs> what his course could be like. So I love those tips that you're sharing with our students <laughs> and our parents. And I think there will be great resource to really help them when we talk about selecting faculty members. I feel like we're going to have you back on here for part two, Dr. Rich. The last question before I get to a personal question for you is how to select your major, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the number one question that we get from, you know, college students or high school students who are going to college, like, how can I select a major, right? What type of advice would you give that student who's trying to figure that out? You know, they mm -hmm. just get 17 year old, 18 year old coming from high school. You tell me I need to, wanna, need to know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then mm -hmm. here, make it make sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love the Howard Thurman quote that was kind of ingrained in us when we were at Morehouse. And it was something along the lines I'm paraphrasing of don't ask what the world wants of you or, or whatever. Ask what makes you come alive. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. I think we're losing. I always teach this passage by Dr. King that says, you know, as the world is getting more technologically rich, it has become orally more poor, right? What is that? There are some disciplines that I think are more trendy right now because of incomes that you might have when you first come out, general things that we're seeing in STEM or business. Those are just bullying things that students are diving into because they think that's all major in to do the sorts of careers they want to do. Um, not only is that typically not true, it also kind of brackets what type of experience that you have. You are going to a school full of people who are business majors, right? That's going to be a very limited scope that you're going to have with your colleagues and stuff like that when it comes to different perspectives about the world. Now, I will admit, I'm in the humanities. I'm in the, the field that's shrinking in some ways. That definitely influences his approach. Right. But I find not just in college, but after college, students who majored in things that made them come alive and, mm. and question that really okay. like like provoke them, yeah. those tend to be students who enjoy their careers and enjoy their majors more than the others, right? And you know, I could have done a lot of things with my philosophy degree, right? I had right. interviewed and got a position with Target Corporate at one point, okay. but I didn't go down that route. I love to teach, but this isn't everybody's route. But I mm -hmm. think people say, oh my gosh, no, you can't make no money with a philosophy degree. I think that's limiting in what kind of experience you could have. And you should ask yourself, what are the courses that make me like even though I don't want to go to class today, like I gotta go because I'm interested in what happened. Right. Exactly. Right? Those are the students who get out. Those okay. are faster, more more commonly. Those oh, are the students true. who look back at their time and their degree more fondly. Okay. Those are the students, even if they ended up pivoting careers or whatever, still find value in the life lessons they learn in that. Right. Major. So true. That that's key. Like, you want to go to school or law school, it doesn't matter what you major in, so, right? <laughs> or something so it's better than that, MCAT scores than others. But, I mean, you could be a dance major and go pre-law. It can happen. So right. if it, it makes you come alive, why wouldn't you major in that? So if, if psychology provokes you in your dreams, why not take that, right? right. If literature makes you see the world differently and just and find value in your life why not invest in that you know so yeah we have a yeah. capital problem going on with higher ed where people think that it's an input output game and i understand a bit of that right. right the people who play the financial game it may or may not have the type of experience they could have had right? so true yes yes i had much more funding to go to Marquette and to have gone pre law, like everybody thought I was going to. I may not have graduated at the time that I did, or you know, went to grad school or whatever. If I had chosen that path, even though it was cheaper, it was in my hometown, all those kinds of things, right? Right, right. Sometimes the easier path is not the best path for you. 
but you have to kind of play that give and take about price, bang for your buck, experience, career, all those things you should be thinking about as you're coming into college. So true. So true. And again, I love how, and I could just see your eyes light up when you talk about teaching, right? And, yeah. you know, I agree. All of that kind of lies with, like you said, number one, persistence, you know, completion, mm -hmm. graduate from college. And then when you get out to the workforce, you're excited, right? It doesn't really feel like a job per se. It just feel like you're just waking up, like you said, wake up daily and you're fulfilling right. your passion. So that that's so true. Um, and you know, a lot of times I tell students, you know, sometimes we do, they do go in choosing one major because of family or like, I love how you said people thought I was going to do this, but I had other plans, right? And I'm glad you were able to yeah. follow your plan. So huge advice for students, go after your purpose, your passion, try things. I think that's big for most students. Like it's okay to try something. If you don't like it, hey, let's go a different route, but don't stop, right? So the last question, yes, the last question brings us to the value of college, right? And so a lot of times we're talking to students now in 2023, right? Where they can go and work for Amazon and they're like, yeah. Hey, Dr. Boyd, I can make $21 an hour and overtime I can make $35 an hour. I'm good. I don't need college. What would you say to that individual who might be questioning is college really worth it? I think we have lost touch with the value of the intangible and don't get me wrong, student loans are absurd. Charging students has gotten out of control. All of those yeah. things are true. For example, in my career, in my kind of trajectory, I went from experiencing some very real prejudices when I was a teenager in Milwaukee that I could not give language to and understanding to, and I did not even know how to tackle those things until I started to dig into what philosophy was talking about regarding these things. I came oh, right. in a philosophy following the legacies of Angela Davis, Kwame Ture, uh, Huey P. Newton, who are all formally trained in philosophy, right? Right, right. And are basing their activism on the theories of philosophy that they learn, both inside and outside of the Western canon. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments where I'm like, yeah, I came out with my own share of debt. I had my own difficulties living a thousand miles away from home. Yeah, yeah. But when I look at the type of life and insight and intellectual curiosity and the things that I bring to stuff outside of my job and academic, like my ministry and what I do in group exercise and all kinds right. of, all of it, it fits together with the outlook that I got that I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't go to college at higher age. Yeah. It's so failure to have in our education system right now that a lot of these things you're not going to get in high school. So, and yeah. so it's an opportunity for you to broaden your horizons to be a better version of yourself. Not, and I need to say, I am, I am my fullest self fresh out of high school. There's so much that I changed and I learned that I, that I grew in by doing the experience of college, both in the academic sense and in the social sense. Uh -huh. It is an invaluable experience right. that we have put a price tag on and an expensive so one. So true. But yes. Education, higher education, not only statistically uh -huh. extend expectancy and things like that, but it also gives you the sort of assets. So when you're at Amazon mm -hmm. and you're seeing exploitation happen in real time, you're able to say, oh, I think a hermeneutical injustice is at play, yeah. right? Yeah, or, so oh, cool. I think that a Marxist critique here might be warranted. Right. There's no wrong with yeah. her, the very real living experiences that we have and we feel these things that we don't always have the tools to dig in and flesh out and, and figure out what we're supposed to do next. Higher education gives you those tools. I think it's worth investing in for the holistic aspect of who we are. So, so that we create yes. ethical, better human beings fundamentally. We ethics in high school. Sorry, most of the time we don't. <laughs> I can't. That you got to take my class just because you've never been challenged in your beliefs and how those affect other people. Right. right. And <laughs> so true. And that yeah. does, it does so many unethical things. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. 
that we're righteous. Right, and right. No challenge is what we believe. Yeah, we can easily fall into doctrine and dogma instead of actually having like robust insights about our lives, about yes. each other. Yes. Else. College still matters. Man, man, man. I feel like we <laughs> put that on a t-shirt, Dr. Reed, if it's okay. Can I feel that from you? Yes. Listen, I a little, just a little dividend. That's all I have. So, <laughs> I give you 2%, you know. Uh, but no, man, this has been great tonight. I've learned a lot just by listening to the interview. So I know our students, our parents, they're going to be taking notes and they might want to follow you, Dr. Reed. So we will have your LinkedIn information and your email and all that great stuff. So if, if students or parents may, who might be interested in Butler, right, and want to have some of those conversations, they can definitely follow you. But with that being said, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Again, to the audience, and, and make sure you go to my website, get the book, www.drshawnford.com. And again, I look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Thank you. Viewers, make sure you tune in weekly. We're going to be having some dynamic interviews just like we just had. Um, also, make sure you go to my website at www.drshawnboard.com. Hopefully by now, you have a copy of How to Play the Game of College. But if not, you can pick up your copy on my website. Again, thank you for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you all on next week. Thank you.